hello guys welcome once again to another youtube tutorial on bioinformatics today's tutorial is going to be on bacterial genomics where i demonstrate with real world data how bacterial genomes can be analyzed in the course of a tutorial you also get to know what kinds of analysis can be done if you have bacterial genomes this is the pipeline that i'm going to use for this tutorial so you follow a series of steps and activities in order to get information about your genome, understand your genome, and then also compare the genetic makeup of your isolates with other organisms as well. I've made available the scripts and the entire pipeline on my GitHub page. This is my GitHub page and this is the repository for this tutorial so you can always go and download them and reproduce whatever I'm doing in this tutorial in terms of the software packages that are used I install them via the Anaconda package manager so Anaconda is a great toolkit for installing softwares it makes software solutions very very simple especially for beginners as a side note, before doing any downstream analysis with your genome data, you should always make sure to check for contamination. And because of this important step, I'm actually going to make a different video tutorial on how to check contamination on your genomic reads. And so this particular aspect was omitted from this pipeline. So first of all, I'm going to open up my terminal here. And because I already have an Aconda installed, I'm first going to call it first. Now, if you install an Aconda for the first time, it's important to configure channels. Channels work like repositories where softwares are housed. So you call this channel and then you specify the software and it will be installed. So I'm going to add four Conda channels before we proceed. One of the channels is Conda Forge. Yeah, so if the, the channel is already set up, then Anaconda will just notify you about this, that it's already there. So let's add another one. It's also already there. Let's add a third one. Which is already there. And the last one. which is also there okay so once we've added the channels then we are going to download the pipeline that I have on github and so for that you need to have the GIT utility that will help you to download it so in this instance we we'll say we clone the repository but this is where all the scripts that I'm going to use are found so the tools that I'm going to use have been set up and then how you call the tools are actually placed in the scripts I'm going to run. And so you can feel free to open the individual scripts and find out what parameters are used for the tools. Okay, so now that we've downloaded it, you can see the into it. It's called Bacteria Dynamics Tutorial. Great. And so in that particular directory, we have all the scripts here. Okay, so let me make the screen a bit clearer here. So once you have this repository cloned, you need to set up the environments. And by that, I mean installing the softwares as well. And so I already have a file called a YAML file here that I used to store it contains all the packages that I will need 
okay and that one is here so we we'll use that to create the conda environment so we create the conda environment using this now i add this quite flag here so that messages are suppressed okay but you can always omit that so that you confirm before packages are installed so once it's done we'll find conda working and resolving the environments and if you take a while and all the softwares are going to be installed okay so we now have the environment set up and the packages installed okay now i will just want to reinstall the python packages again so just to make sure that i already have those packages installed okay so we do yeah, there actually before you install you must first activate your environment so i think i omitted that step so let me just do that first okay so once you have an environment activated the environment name will come here okay very important that you take note that means the environment has been set up you now have access to the softwares installed in that environment okay so now i have the environment set up so we can proceed just to make sure i have my python package installed okay so they already installed okay so the next step is to install a software this was a java software so i had to install that separately so i first create a directory called apps and then i will download that software it's called pillon and that's what we use in one of the stages so download that java file and place it in that directory okay so it's saved let me clear the screen to make it nicer so before we execute the scripts we need to add executable rights to it so because i have a number of files with different extensions i'll just put all of them together and then give the rights okay so now that we have the environment set up we can now start the analysis so the first step is to download the data sets so there's a script to do that for us so there's the raw reads that i'm downloading from the ebi database okay so data is complete so it will be in a directory called data here so let's confirm yeah, so it's a paired end sequence as we have here okay now what we are going to do next is to check for the qc of the data okay so we do that using the fast qc tool so I've already prepared a script for that. So let's execute that particular one. So QC. Well, let's first confirm that I have fast QC installed. Okay, so fast QC is already there. So 
we can proceed so you see your rates and then to perform the QC for the raw rates so QC will be done for both reads that's the R1 and then the R2 okay and this reads the QC will be placed in this directory that's the QC raw reads and so in that particular directory we have an HTML file here that indicates the QC okay yes now so before we proceed let's quickly take a look at the QC results and we will view the HTML file for read 1 and then read 2 okay so this we cannot view on the terminal so we open from the browser so we'll begin with the first read which is here you we'll go through just a few of them so if you look at the per base now if we do the QC there are three colors that will be shown so we have green which means it's okay we have red which signals that something is wrong some point we have this light brown color here that shows a warning okay so if you look at the per base sequence quality they are mostly above 30 which shows that the red quality is good okay but because it's a luminous sequence usually as it goes towards the end of the reads the quality starts um, to reduce and that is why we have this particular section um, being reduced to around 22 but in general uh, most of the reads are above 30 okay but if you look at this section there are some warnings here as well okay but in general the read quality is good and we have a similar observation here for read 2 here as well so in general the quality is good but you realize that read 2 the quality compared to read 1 the quality for read 2 is a bit lower and you can see more of the reads um, having a lower quality at the ends okay so this is for the QC so this is the QC for the raw reads that we have shown now we will do a trimming which is the next step and we will now compare the trim rates to see the effect of the trimming whether it has increased so whether it has improved the quality or not and so we will do the trimming next we do trimming for a number of reasons and one of the reasons we do trimming is to remove bad quality rates we also can also do trimming to remove sequence adapters and then we have some other activities you can use the trimming to do okay but basically trimming is meant to improve your reads and also to remove unwanted reads which might affect downstream analysis so i have a script to do the trimming for us so let's check if the script is there that's the trim reads so you do the trimming for the data and so for the trimming I use the software called Circle okay so Circle has completed the trimming now the trim rates are located here and so when Circle does the trimming you have three files being generated you have the read one, read two, and then the unpaired reads are the single reads. Okay, so this is what we have. And so for the subsequent analysis, it's just trimmed reads that we are going to use. But before we do that, let's also check the QC for the trimmed reads. So I do the QC for trimmed reads, and then first QC starts 
a QC analysis. Okay, so QC is complete, and that will be found here in the QC trend rates. Also, the same HTML files will be there. So let's open that particular HTML for the for the trim rates. So for the trim rates, that's what we have. Now compare just one section of it. Now if you look, let's go back to the untrimmed rates. If you look at the untrimmed rates, this is what we have. Now let's take note of this particular section over represented sequences. Now when we come here, that's the trim rates. The over represented sequences is now green. Okay, so this gives us an indication that there has been an improvement in the reads. Okay, so that's what we have um, for this particular read. Now let's look at read number two. We also have this section here. Let's look at the overrepresented and let's check. It's also checked green. And so the trimming that we did has indeed improved the quality of the reads. And so we can proceed with the rest of the analysis using the trimmed rates. So your next step will be to perform a genome assembly and for that we'll use the software called SPITS. So using the trim rates, we will now do the assembly. So it proceeds to perform the genome assembly. Great. So now we have the assembled genome, and this can be found in the P7741 split out directory. So that's the files here. Now in the assembly files, what we are interested in is the context.faster and then the scaffolds.faster. Okay, so we are going to proceed by using the scaffold.faster for the downstream analysis. Of course, this one can be used, but I'm assuming that scaffold.faster has a higher N50 than context.faster, so I'm going to use this for the downstream analysis. But before the downstream analysis, it's also important that you do polishing of the draft assembly. That's what we have. And so we proceed to do polishing as well. So we do the polishing using the pylon software. So let's polish our draft genome. Now pylon allows you to do several rounds of polishing. So for this tutorial and the script I have, I made pylon do four rounds of polishing. Generally, it's expected that multiple rounds of polishing will improve your draft assembly. But that's not always so in all the cases. So you could have some changes occurring after several rounds of polishing. Okay. And also, you could have changes occurring after each round of polishing. So you can have situations where three rounds of polishing will be the best we also have situations whereby four polishing will give a better output. So for the rounds of polishing, it's subject to the individual who's using that particular tool. Okay, so now the polishing is complete. So polishing will be found here. Okay, so that's where the polished draft assembly will be found. Now it's also important you do QC for your assembled genome. And so for this tutorial, we are going to do QC for both the initial assembly that was done with space as well as the polished assembly. And so to do that, you use a tool called Quest to do that particular activity. So I've set it up such that it will do the quality for checks for both speeds, files, and then the P 
kill on fast so let's check okay so quest uses a reference you know for some comparisons so you always have to make sure you have that option satisfied so the quest output will be here at the QC assembly okay so in the QC assembly we have the files there so let's quickly check the QC for the draft assemblies so there is a file that will be generated after the quest QC has completed and so that will also let us know the quality of the polishing whether it had an effect or not so let's look at this PDF file here now in assessing the quality there are a number of metrics you have to check and one of these metrics is N50 and so after polishing or let me say in comparing the one with the higher N50 should be used for a subsequent analysis but in this case if you check here the scaffolds the initial assembly and then there's the polished ones so if you check the n50 there wasn't any change and so this tells us that the qc that sorry the polishing that we did did not have any change in the quality with respect to the n50 metrics let's also compare the gc content if you check the GC content, there wasn't any change here. In general, GC content shouldn't be low and shouldn't be high, too high. But we should see some changes before and after polishing. But in this case, there isn't any change. Okay, there are other metrics we can also use to check, such as misassemblies. So in the misassembly, here yeah, we realize that there is a slight change for the scaffolds the initial draft it's 137 and then here it was 136 so just one difference okay we can also visualize the results quest generates this html file here which also has some information on the qc so let's quickly look at that particular one as well so it is what we have so we have some heat maps indicating worst and best comparatively speaking okay i'll shift that one and move to this graph here let's check this one and so in general this values here should be different for the raw as well as the polished one but in this case we don't see any change here okay so this tells us that there wasn't any improvement significant improvements in the draft assembly so if you check here let me just uncheck there's a reference let's use some of this there's a reference sorry this assembly is not for reference this assembly this are for the assemble one so if you check the blue one is for the polish let's uncheck the scaffolds okay so this is for the polish okay now if you add the scaffolds they are all using almost the same line indicating that there wasn't any significant change and so for this particular data set here polishing did not have any effect and i'm not surprised because um the data set i'm using i didn't use the entire data set the original paper actually combined illumina rates and the nanopore but for this tutorial we are only using the illumina rates and that is why some of these changes are occurring so that's um, a disclaimer here that the results that is i'm having here 
it's not the result that was obtained in the original paper this is different because we are using part of the data sets so for the rest of the tutorial i'm assuming that's the assumption i'm using that the polishing improved the draft assembly and so the subsequent analysis will use a polished one so now after doing the polishing and you are okay with your results the next step is to do what you call the reference guided scaffolding so scaffolding basically is stitching the context together into a continuous length but we add a reference to this particular process and so that what um, the reference is used more like as a template to remove context that do not match a particular criteria so the tool we use for this reference guided scaffolding is RATAC. so RATAC takes the reference genome and then maps the context to the reference genome and after mapping takes the context that's mapped to this reference genome and then reorder all those mapped contexts to suit the regions where they mapped and by doing that it generates a scaffold and this scaffold now becomes our draft genome so let's do the reference guided scaffold so the script that i use here is the reorder context so that will do the ordering for us now after doing the ordering i have a script that also quickly checks some information about the genome the draft genome and so here we can see that the length is 5291728 but the reference genome which was used that's leflandi reference genome okay that one is six to something okay it's uh, more it's higher than this particular one and the dc content for the reference is also higher now the reference genome is also part of the downloaded data sets from github so if you look at genomes this is where the reference genome is okay that's what i used so now we have our draft genome here which we we'll use for the subsequent analysis so the draft genome is also here that's what is saved here p7741 dot reordered faster that is the draft genome so after getting the draft genome we can proceed with some other activities to try and understand our genome and try to get the genetic makeup of our organism okay and one of the things we can also do is to check for the multi local sequence typing so mlst for short uses a set of housekeeping genes to identify bacterial genomes okay so it can be used to identify bacterial genomes so i use the mlst package available at github by seaman all the tools are also given at the end of the tutorial so let's check the mlst to try and then genotype our sequence so we do mlst and then it starts doing the checks now there's a hit so using those set of housekeeping genes the tool has identified this and all this as mycobacteria and of course the data set i'm using is a mycobacteria isolate and so this also confirms that the data set we are using is for that particular organism and so mlst can also be a technique to confirm the type of organism that you are dealing with and it also generates an output file for you that you can always check that's the mlst csv which is here 
Now the next step, we'll try and get some properties for the organism. And so we'll do a check for antimicrobial resistance genes. So we'll proceed to do that. And to do that, we use a tool called Appricate, which is also freely available. So we check for the aim and uh, And notes, I'm using the draft genome. So that's what I use for this one. So Appricate has returned a hit here. One hit was retained, so you can see that there was a hit here. It has the accession number has been given here, so we can look up the accession number to know more about this particular gene. But from this note here, we know that this particular gene is resistant to gentamicin and this particular chemical. Okay. And we also have the percentage identity here, that's 82.27%. Now, in making a decision as to whether an organism or a genome contains antimicrobial resistant genes, there are more activities that you have to do aside using the aggregate to identify the hit. But that is not the focus of this tutorial. So for this tutorial, we assume that aggregate has given us a hit and there is a an antimicrobial resistant gene in this particular data, which makes it interesting. After doing this particular activity, we will now annotate. Now we are doing annotation so that we'll be able to identify the genomic features for this organism. I already made a video tutorial on genome annotation and you can click on the link being shown. So we perform the genome annotation using software Proca. So let's do the annotation. Great, so now the annotation is complete. Okay, so the annotation files can be found here in this folder. So if you see ls to that folder, you can just confirm the files. So these files are here. We are going to discuss more on the results for this particular activity in the later section. Now, after doing the annotation, we can quickly scan through and find out some information about this particular genome, such as CDS, that's the coding sequence, such as the number of predicted genes, such as insertion sequence, and a whole lot of others. And so I have a Python script that can do a quick scan to give us some information about the annotation. And so I'll call that script, which is here, get annot starts and then get the information for us. So it's a Python script, so I run with Python. Start. So it accepts two kinds of information. The directory which contains the annotation files and the names, the prefix, the base name for all the files. In this instance, it's P7741. Let's just confirm that before. So this is the directory. And then the directory, this is the base name. So the base name is the name that comes before the file extension. Okay, so we have it here. Okay, so now we can proceed. So Python gets a note starts. And then the prefix. Okay, so let's start the scan. Great. 
So we have this information, the CDS, number of CDS features, we have 5084, number of predicted genes also here. And we also have this information about tRNA and others. We also have insertion sequences here. And we also have pseudogens also indicated here. So at least we have some information about our isolates. Now it's time for some comparative analysis. Once you have your draft genome, you will want to compare with other genomes and then see what are the differences in terms of genetic makeup. And so if in situations where let's say you pick your isolate from let's say a bacterial infected uh, region, Let's just assume there was an outbreak of a disease somewhere and then you pick um, the isolate from that region. Now you can compare this isolate with other forms of this bacterial organism and see the genetic differences. And that could probably explain why your isolate is virulent, very virulent and is causing issues in that particular region. And so comparative analysis will help us to understand some of these questions. In doing the comparative analysis, I have some genomes here that I want to do this analysis with. So these are located here in the genomes directory. Okay. So there are five of them here. I could also count using this. That tells us five of them. Okay, that we are going to compare with. And so we'll, the first task we will do is to generate dendrogram. So we generate dendrogram using ANI, which is the average nucleotide identity. And the tool we are going to use is called DREP. Okay, so DREP will generate dendrograms using the average nucleotide identity of the genomes that we are interested in. So let's first generate the dendrogram. Let's clear the screen first and then generate the ANI based dendrogram. So it uses MASH clustering and then the ANI algorithms to generate this dendrograms for us. Discussion of this dendrogram will be in a later section of this tutorial. Okay, so the dendrogram has been generated. And we have it here. So it will be in a directory called dendrogram. So if we ls into that section, that's, we have this. And the files we'll be discussing will be in this particular folder. Okay, so we'll discuss about the primary clustering and the secondary clustering. So now this is the first comparative analysis. The next one we are going to do is the pangenome analysis. And this analysis will help us to know which genes are present for certain organisms, I mean, in our genomes. And so if you have genome A, genome B, pangenome analysis will help us to know which genes are common to both genomes and which genes are unique to each of these genomes. And so to do this pangenome analysis, we use the software called Rory. Now, Rory accepts GFF files. And from the documentation on the website of a developer, it's recommended to use proper generated GFF files. And so we already have GFF file for our isolate, which is here, but the rest of the genomes, we still need to generate GFF files for them. And so we we'll proceed by first generating that GFF files. And so we we'll use a script called the Get Genome GFFs for this particular 
file. There's the script. Let me just cd to it to see. Let's just check. There's the scripts to do it. Okay. So let's proceed. So what is basically being done is that Proca is reannotating all these genomes to generate the GFF file. And these GFF files will all now be copied into a particular folder where Rory can take and then do the analysis. Okay, so GFF has been generated. You can just confirm my checking. So we have all the GFFs generated. Yeah, and they are here. So the next is to perform the pangenome analysis with Rory. Now that we have our input files ready. So you want to be get pangenome.sh and then we proceed with the analysis. Great. So now the pangenome analysis is complete and this can be found in the pangenome folder, which is here. So let's check the contents of it. Yeah, so look at this images here. Okay, and then I will explain those images in the later section. Now, the pangenome generates the genes for various isolates. And so those information can also be extracted into a more um, visually appealing form. So you could visualize the genetic differences of individual genomes. And so I have a script that can get a gene summary um, for three isolates at a time for us and put it into a Venn diagram for us. And so to do that particular one, that script is the get is the gene count summary dot pi. And so to do that, you first need to call Python because it's a Python script. Uh, let me clear the screen to make it better. We have Python, gene count summary, and then you specify the isolates that you want to analyze. So first, let's analyze three closely related mycobacteria organisms. That's our isolates here. And then AGY99, that's M or strands AGY19, and then M or strands Flandy. And then I also specify a file from which the information will be used. That's a gene presence absence file. It's a CSV file. So it generates for us an image. And there's the image. Okay, because we want to generate another one by default, the same name is given. So let's rename um, this one. Let's label this one as P7741. P7741 aging Y99 and then let's write the script again but this time we analyze P7741 with Flandy and then H37IV which is mycobacterium tuberculosis genome and then we'll see how it goes. So for that one too, let's rename it as P7741 A37RV Flander. Okay, great. So this for the comparative analysis. The next step is to generate ring structures. And so this will enable us to visually compare the genomes that we have. 
and to do that particular one we use the software called Brick and I've made a video of that particular activity and the link can be found by clicking the notification above and so the tutorials is very easy to follow and then apply as well so I encourage you to do that as soon as possible so the next step is to zip the files which is a way of organizing it so that you can easily get all the relevant results and then view and then analyze and discuss and if you're also working on a cloud on a computing um, server somewhere then this script will also help you to just zip all the relevant files download to your local machines and then start dissecting the information from there so to do that there's a script to help us zip the relevant files here so i'll do that but first let me clear the screen first so the zip file will now have results and to start zipping it now for the images that were generated i always recommend if you are going to rename the images the extension should be .jpg so that the script automatically picks that file so that's what you have to note so once the zip file is complete then you can download and then view locally okay so the zip file will be located here by using the ls command you can view all the files so it will be results.zip so now you can download and then view and if you're already on a local machine then you can just go to your browser file browser and then just locate the files okay so I have my results here, the zip file, so you can see all the relevant files being zipped here for you. Okay, so this is what it is. Now I extracted mine here, and that's what we are going to look at. Okay, so the first one we are going to look at is the dendrogram, which is here. We are interested in this particular one. So let's look at the clusterings here we have primary and then secondary clustering now let's look at the primary clustering so if you look at the primary clustering we have two primary clusters being formed to know the number of clusters being formed you have to look at this first there are two numbers here you have to look at the first number here across all the isolates and so you can see you that there is one here and there is two here and also the clusterings are usually differentiated using colors and so here you can have we have one cluster with blue and another cluster with somehow a uh, brown color okay so this indicates two clusters two primary clusters so one you look at the values here and then that will tell you the primary clusters and then the color as well and then the next number is for secondary clusters so if there is another there are other clusters that are actually sprouting from um, the previous clusters then that will be indicated here so from here we know that for the first primary cluster there is only one secondary cluster here and you can look at it from this side Good. so you can see that A37RV is forming a separate cluster and then these ones are also forming a separate cluster and so this also lets us know H37RV is a mycobacterium tuberculosis so whatever we are seeing is expected because these ones are all mycobacterium or strands organisms okay and this one is mycobacterium tuberculosis so 
Yes, that's the difference in genetic makeup. They are they 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 are they they are, they are distant relatives, of course, but there's a difference because these belong to different species. Okay, so so this particular clustering was to be expected. When we also come here, there is a clustering here, and there's a clustering here, and then we also have a clustering there about here. And so this 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 they form a secondary cluster as well so this is one cluster one cluster primary cluster and then in the primary cluster you also have these individual clusters that are forming the secondary clusters so this average nucleotide identity algorithm enables us to identify similarities between isolates at a much deeper level so depending on the number of isolates and the genetic makeup you have several other clusters as well and so if this particular we had another uh, macrobacterial tuberculosis strain then we would have formed part of a secondary cluster for this particular section okay so this is for the um, clustering of a and a and i dendrogram and so by putting this into a dendrogram we can visually compare our organisms and so it's the saying that a picture is worth a thousand words and that is why it's important that we always visualize our genomes okay so this is for the primary cluster now let's look at the secondary cluster so this also generated by drip here and so if the secondary cluster has more than one member then it will be given a page here okay so in this instance it's just the primary cluster one that had several members so that is why that one was also placed here so that you can get details of that particular clustering here as well and so this is for the secondary cluster okay so this is how the dendrograms are generated using the drip python package aside the dendrogram we also generate a pangenome pangenome matrix here and so with the pangenome there are a number of files that are generated here but this is what i'll be focusing on in this tutorial so if you look at this image if you look at this image we have a couple of gene clusters forming okay so here again too, we find something interesting h37 having forms a separate cluster okay from these other ones there is a cluster here there's a cluster here and there's a cluster here okay so this in terms of the genetic makeup in terms of the gene content this and this are similar this and this are similar and then the two of these have also a similar uh, makeup with this and then this one it's kind of an outline and you can actually see it by viewing the gene clusters here if you look at a3 iv there's a lot of genes here missing they are not missing per se but these are genes these that are not in this particular region for the other isolates okay so that is what makes it interesting so there are a lot of genes that are present here that are not present here and so we have this information here being the different color but if you look at leflandia and p774 they have a similar um, gene cluster with the exception of just few differences and that is why they cluster here the same applies to agy99 and sgl03 they have similar gene clusters here and then it starts been different as we go to the side. If you look at Shinswenzi, it also has similar clusters for this side, and then here it becomes different. Okay, so that is for the pangenome analysis. Aside 
this particular matrix, there's also a gene presence absence file here that will also be of interest to anyone who wants to check on it. So that one is here. Okay, so I also generated a graph that compared the gene content for three organisms, and these are here. So the first one was P77 aging Y99 in Flandy. So you can visually look at um, the gene content. So if you look at this here, we have 430 genes being unique to P771. We have 683 for the Flandy and aging Y99 had. 127 okay so this tells us some interesting information when you come here this isolates that's our draft genome and the flandish share 186 genes ag199 shares 76 with the isolates and it shares six with six the uh, and so this lets us know that in terms of gene similarity P7741 and the Flandy are closer than P7741 and AGY99. And there's also the central gene which was shared among these three. And so this is an important information that can even be used to distinguish between closely related bacteria organisms. The next one was comparing with H37RV. Yeah, so this is also interesting. So this information has been displayed, but if you check here, 3904 genes were unique to H37RV, and that explains why it was clustering separately in both the dendrogram and the pangenome matrix. P7741 and A37RV shared no gene in common. It also shared no gene with 6A3, with Liflandi. Okay, and there's only one gene that was common among this. And so that also shows how, um, distan how the, 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 the distance of relation in terms of A37RV and then P7741. Okay, so this provides a lot of insight into bacterial genome analysis. Aside this one, there's also a result for MLST, which we have already displayed, but I'll just show it here. So a CSV file is generated that tells you the genotyping. And so here it's macrobacteria. Okay, that's what we did with the MLST. So it's shown here. So the spreadsheet is always there. And we also have the AMR summary that the antimicrobial resistance gene. So that is also here, and it gives a spreadsheet that tells you the information that was displayed. And so you can always go back, look into it, and go to NCBI and even check the accession number and find out what gene it is. And finally, we will look at the genome comparison through visualization ring structure of ring structures. And to do that, we use break to generate this cool image here that you can visually analyze. So the reference genome is this particular one. And that is what is displayed here for the length. So the length for the reference genome is what will be displayed at the center here. And then we have the legends indicating um, the genomes and the labels that were given to it and GC content and GC skew. Now if you compare the reference genome here, there are gaps across all the genomes in certain regions. Okay. Now a break introduces gaps if the sequences are not similar. 
and by default the threshold is 50 percent identity so if it's less than 50 percent identity break you say it's not similar so it will make it a gap and so it can be a true gap or it could be that the genes the, the sequence there are not similar to the reference genome and that is why we have this information there and finally here are the list of tools that was used for the analysis so these are the list of tools that was used for this tutorial and these tools are all available they are free to download and you can use them easily okay so these are the tools that was used and as i said anaconda package manager makes it easy to install these tools i hope you had a great time with this tutorial and i hope you practice and be an expert in analyzing of bacterial genomes i'll see you again in the next video have a nice day and goodbye